Good morning. The Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 1 through 10. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever. For thy Lord, the Lord is the eternal, the rock eternal. He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the, to the dust. Feet trample it down, the feet of the oppressed, the footsteps of the poor. The path of the righteous is level. O upright one, make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. My soul yearns, yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world would learn righteousness. Though great, grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn the righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they go on do, doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called, called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, um, I don't normally uh, pray before a sermon, but I'm going to ask for you to bow with me for a moment. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, at this time, I just ask that you strip back all of my flesh and you only put your righteousness through these words. What a tough block of uh, scripture for us to digest today. And Lord, just remove me from it and let your righteousness shine through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I did that because I'm nervous as I'll get out. Um, I can tell you that. About this block of scripture, because... Every pastor's worst nightmare is after they give a sermon and then the line gets next to the pastor and they said, hey, huh, you forgot this, right? This is one of those blocks of scripture where I can put everything that, from my understanding into it, my limited, my flawed understanding into it, and still forget a point. So I'm going to ask for your forgiveness up front because I'll probably let some of you down in many elements of this sermon. But I can tell you that the way I understand it to be, in my flawed understanding, is that it's about whose righteousness fills full the law. Okay? Fulfills, fills full. I know it's bad grammar, Tanya, I know. She, she tried to correct me. She's like, Dave, we can't put that on there. It's bad grammar. <laughs> so I was like, oh, no. The sermon title. Right? So today we're going to break into this with understanding. We must try to put our mind around understanding because it's so key in life. You know, my wife and I, who I pick on a lot, and I love you, I know this wasn't scripted, um, but in the relationship, and I won't pick on who, who's who, but there is an emotional thinker and there's a logical thinker in every decision that we make, okay? And when we, when we do this, um, we don't understand the other's viewpoint a lot. So it causes arguments, right? So basically within this fulfillment of the law, there's two understandings. There's two understandings. Those who were sitting there listening to the words of Christ and their viewpoint, their um, upbringing, their influence, all those who they conform to, which was the law. And then there's Christ who's coming to say that he's fulfilling it. But now we must understand us. We have a different take on this because Christ has fulfilled the law, if we think about it. All right? They didn't have that information then. So our understanding of this is different, okay, than theirs. 
They just have the law. And the reason why I'm going to say this is that understanding is so key because when we look at the Old Testament only, we tend to forget about the love of the New Testament. When we look at the New Testament only, we soak ourselves in that love and forget that we still need to be obedient to God. Okay? Maybe not to the letter of His law perfectly, but we still need to be obedient. But it's a motive in which we are obedient that we must remember. Okay, so I'm going to say this is about whose righteousness fills the law full. You know, an example of understanding. You know, it's amazing if we all had the full understanding of things, how many problems would be solved correctly and how many problems would be avoided after? What would you say? Gosh, do we create our own problems? We do. Um, I'm going to use this example from a movie that I'm not promoting, nor am I asking you to show your kids. Um, but it's the only thing that comes to mind in this moment. Um, my favorite movie chain is the Alien movie with Sigourney Weaver. I don't know. It, it may be dating some of you, because I think the movie I'm going to refer to came out in 1986. Yes, kids, 1986. All right. Yeah. I may act young, but I'm getting up there. All right, so two characters, one who's thinking emotionally and one who is thinking logically, were looking at this motion detector because these aliens were coming towards them as they barricaded themselves, like, say, in the sanctuary. They welded all the doors. They barricaded themselves in, and all they could see is this mass of aliens coming towards them on the, on the uh, <laughs> motion detector. One is saying, all right, they're 20 feet away, 19 feet, 18 feet, 17 feet, and then all of a sudden, the logical thinker goes, but that's right outside the door. All right? And they're getting ready. And then all of a sudden, it's 15 feet, 15 feet, 14. And the logical thinker goes, that's inside the room. This can't be possible. You're not reading it right. All right? And the other character goes, if you don't think I'm reading right, look at it. 13 feet. So all of a sudden, the logical thinker had an epiphany. He looks up at the ceiling lifts up the ceiling tile, shines his light in, and all these aliens are coming towards him. All right? Lack of understanding. That one little bit of information is key to the full understanding of solving all of our problems. So within this, I'm going to ask us to look at it from different perspectives. I want us to look at it in the sandals of those who were standing or sitting before Christ when he was teaching them. We have to understand that they instantly, when Christ Jesus was laying out the Beatitudes, talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and then all of a sudden he went to salt and light, which is the result of God's righteousness, guess what they were thinking instantly? What about our law? What about our law? Why haven't you said anything to validate our law? Okay? That's instantly what they're thinking. Okay, but we must understand they set their watch by it. Li not literally, because they didn't have watches, I guess. But they knew the day, they knew the week, they knew the month, they knew the year through this ritual, through these misunderstood, misinterpreted laws. Not that God gave them down misunderstood, or God gave them down misinterpreted. They were perfect. In every sense, they were perfect. Because they were full of God's divine truth and love. Okay? How I'm going to lay this out today, um, is Liam paying attention? Yeah, he is. All right. So, let's put it this way. I had a wonderful lunch with my son the other day. It was dinner. And we were at Country Gardens, okay? And all of a sudden, I see his wheels turning. Okay? Smoke coming out of his ears because he was thinking about something. And he said... Dad, how does power get to the outlet for when we plug things in and you can power things? He's four. Okay, and I'm, and I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about this. Going, how in the world am I, I going to answer this to a four-year-old? Of course, power is hooked up to a country garden. It runs through the circuit breakers and the panel and to the wires and to the outlet, all that stuff. And he's going to look at me like, what are you talking about? So what did good old dad tell him? 
don't stick your finger in the outlet. Right? Okay, when we think about the Old Testament law, we have to think there's over 300, thou shalt not. Do not. Right? It's 200 plus. Do. I can't even remember half the time to put deodorant on, let alone 300 of these things. I'm kidding, I wear deodorant every day. All right. That's the first thing that came to mind. All right, I do. All right. Or at least you hope I do, right? All right. So when we look at these things, we must understand Christ came to fulfill the law. Because when we look at the law, all we see is the do not. All we see is the legal aspect of it, of God trying to limit me from having all this fun. I can't believe this. My goodness. I can't believe he's telling me, no, don't do this, don't do that. I had an interesting conversation in the confirmation class. I'm making sure she's not in here, so I do not embarrass her. I will not use her name. But she, when I, I said the same thing to her. I said, so what's the first thing that you think about when someone tells you do not? She goes, I want to do it. Right? All right I want to do it. So when we look at the negative aspect of the law, instantly all we see are the negative aspects. We see the limiting father. We see the dad that doesn't want us to have any fun instead of seeing the love in it. Because what we need to see in the law is that God cares enough to tell us not to do it. All right? Gee, it's amazing. It made me reach out to my dad this week (laughs) and say, I am so sorry for all that I did when you told me not to because I see now that you love me. (laughs) You weren't trying to keep me from not having fun. You're trying to say, I want to keep you safe. You are valuable to me. You are important to me. You have purpose. I love you in these do not do's. So when we think about understanding, I want us to think about Martin Luther for a moment. Uh, He believed that the key to understanding the Scriptures lay firmly in the understanding of the law and the gospel. And within these two elements, we can either stray to one side or to the other, as I said earlier. Okay? And this is, to me, why Christ is laying this down to his ears. Okay? We must understand that the law had gravely been misinterpreted, gravely been misapplied and um, practiced from when it was brought in to this moment. Because it became a demanding set of rules, a demanding structure that you get your own self-worth from in their eyes. And that's why Christ to me says, do not think for one moment that I've come to abolish this law. Now I want us to think about abolish and what it means. If we think of abolish, it means remove something from authority, let's say. I want us to think of a null. It's a better word. Because Christ is saying, I'm not taking your law and ridding it completely to where there's no trace of it. I'm not replacing it. I'm coming to complete it. I'm coming to take this cup and fill it full of my righteousness. And the mind-blowing thing to me is that His righteousness was found in the law from the very beginning when God gave it down. This isn't something that was added later as we hear so often. Well, God, oh gosh, we messed that up. Had to send his son. He had to go down to heaven in his own bodily form to fix his own mess up. You know, sorry for the southern. All right. <laughs> I work on that. Next evaluation, say no southern. We must understand it was perfect from the beginning, but the hearers did not see Christ in it. They did not see the love in it. They did not see the righteousness in it. They saw their own. They call their own righteousness. You know, when God is talking about, and I, I'll read it here, um, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. At that time frame, I would say that not one stroke of the law was dealt with. All right? 
When Christ died as the only sacrifice, the only sacrifice that was needed, not a repetitive sacrifice that had to go on and on, he fulfilled that sacrificial law. And when we look at the civil and the, the judicial law of the Old Testament, Christ is found in each and every one of them. His righteousness, His love is found in each and every one of them. If we, we don't think this, when we look at that law, all we're going to see is when Megan steals from me, I get to cut her hand off. Right? Oh, it's happened. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's what she gets. So, really good to see you this morning. <laughs> or, if we commit adultery, guess what? Let's line them up. Line them up. Let's throw stones at them until they die. Okay? Without Christ, that is the punishment. What we must understand in this is that there was a one-time price paid. Okay? A one-time curse that was lifted. Because the moment that we think that we can obtain the standards of this law that God put into place, we fool ourselves. We fool ourselves. For we rest in our own righteousness, which is venom. We rest in poison instead of a blessed act of Christ Jesus, who bore the curse as He was put on the tree, as His blood was shed once and for all to cover the sin. I have to regroup because I'm way off, <laughs> way off course here. But it's good. You know, I want us to think about what Christ was saying in not trying to limit or deduce the law in the eyes of the Pharisees and the scribes, or anyone who takes the law. The only way that we, under our own power, under our own righteousness, can meet or achieve the law is by deducing it. And I'll give you an example, okay? Liam, I'm sorry, buddy, but let's say I tell my son, do not touch that remote control on that table. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to run to the kitchen, and he's going to grab a pair of tongs, and he's going to pick up that remote control and say, hi, Dad, not touching it, but I'm still obeying your law. <laughs> right? That's what he would do, and I love him, because he's creative. Very creative, but we all are. Because when we look to God's law, that's what we do with it. It's the only way without Christ we can live up to it. It's by taking the standard and deducing it so far down to where we can even need it. All right? But we don't need to do that. We don't need to. Because Christ's righteousness alone filled the law. Christ's righteousness alone met the standard of the law. Okay? Christ alone. You ever wonder why Christ, or why he says here that our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes or the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? You ever wonder? He says those who deduce the law will be lower in the kingdom of heaven, and those who stick to it will be higher in the kingdom of heaven. But we must remember, only through Christ can we be higher. Only through His righteousness can we be higher. It's almost like a backward assertion because he, Christ always says, those who are lower are actually higher, those who are higher are actually lower. You know, when we think about our righteousness and it exceeding uh, the scribes and the Pharisees to us, it doesn't mean much. Okay, it doesn't. Because we didn't live in that time frame. We didn't live in that time frame, but to those people, they were mind blown. <laughs> they were going, how in the world is anyone able to meet the kingdom of heaven? How? If these Pharisees, if these scribes, the ones that we look to as the example of holy living, can't do it, we're all doomed. All right? That's how they saw it. When we read that, we don't see it like that that often, because we're deduced to it. We're not as sensitive to those words. But I'm going to tell you what it points to is that only righteousness that comes from Christ Jesus can fill the law. Only righteousness from Christ can meet every standard. Only 
righteousness from Christ can help us to obey every single commandment. Only through Christ can we fill full the law. We must understand this. I want us to, I'm going to close with some topics or some quotes from Martin Luther. Um, I'll tell you what, I struggled a lot with the sermon because it just wasn't clicking until I read some of what Martin Luther said. So I'm going to close with some quotes by him and ask a few questions, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. You know, we must understand that our interpretation of God's Word, our understanding of God's Word must, must bridge both Old Testament and New Testament. Again, if we're just looking to one, we will stray to that side. And if we're looking to the other, we'll stray to that side. But they must be looked together through one continuous story, one lens. Otherwise, we'll be the Father who says, do not, and we'll think that He hates us. Or we'll think, Father, do, when He tells us. Or maybe doesn't tell us at all, and He's too loving, in our opinion. But... Martin Luther, as I said. We need to ask ourselves, do we take our faith seriously? And do we take it through the lens of both the law and the gospel? Luther said the law is for the proud, the gospel is for the brokenhearted. The law discovers the disease, but the gospel gives the remedy. He says in one of my favorite quotes, those who lack from the gospel to the law are no better off than those who lapse from grace to idolatry. Another favorite. The law proves that we cannot stand before God in our own righteousness, and that drives us to the gospel. We must know that the, the law can tell us what to do and how to live, but it fails to give us the power or the means to do so, and that's what Christ's righteousness does for us. It gives us the power. It gives us the means. It's not up to us to do so. We can fulfill the law to our joy, to our blessedness. You know, just because the law does not bless us or transform us of itself, it doesn't mean it's not divine. It's authoritative because it was handed down from God. Just as the gospel was given from God, You know, just as Christ went through the Beatitudes, looking to God in His righteousness, and then went through salt and light, and to God's righteousness alone visible through us, Christ is saying that only a righteousness greater than the Pharisees and the scribes will be a part of God's kingdom. Not through self-righteousness that a Pharisee who lacked a full understood would be displaying, but only through the fulfillment of all righteousness through Christ Jesus. Are we resting in the righteousness of Christ Jesus through faith? Are we living by the Holy Spirit within us? Or are we living by the flesh? I'm going to ask us one more question. Are we trying to please our way into heaven? Or are we trying to plead our way into heaven? Please. Think about that. Are we trying to please God by saying, I can do this more, this more, this more, and I will get His attention by doing so? Or are we dropping to our knees, begging for the only righteousness that's available? Because it's not from us. It's not. Only through faith. In the only one who fully obeyed the law. Only in faith. To the one who came to fulfill the law only in faith that all the prophets of the Old Testament point to through their message and every single law points to can we fulfill the law but it's through Christ's righteousness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, forgive me for my Flesh, my understanding of what this says, as many things could be injected. Lord, um, I ask for forgiveness at this time as I stand before you, not understanding this, 
as well as I would like to, but Lord, I trust you that that understanding will come in time. Lord, I hope, it is my prayer that every single person in here was blessed with your word in some way, shape, or form. Not every word's perfect. Not every obedient act by our hands and our feet is perfect. Only through your Son, Jesus Christ, and His righteousness may perfection be found. And Lord, let us all rest in this faith. Lord, let the Holy Spirit come into each and every one of our lives to rip apart the flesh and to inject your righteousness. Lord, thank you for the abundance that you give in every single promise of your gospel, in every single law of the Old Testament in those five books, in every single message that started with a promise. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.